categorical variables are variables that collect data in groups or in categories, as the name implies. The categories or levels should be mutually exclusive and exhaustive. So unlike continuous data, where each response could take a number on a continuum or a sp within a space of numbers, categories for categorical data are predefined levels that the responses will fit into. So when the levels are mutually exclusive, this means that the responses that are available for selection should not overlap. That's easy for the concept of responses like yes, no. It can be more difficult the more complex the options are or with a higher number of options. Let's take a look at, at some examples. On the left, you can see examples of categories that are not mutually exclusive with the comparable mutually exclusive categories listed on the right side. So for example, if a question asked in the past, how frequently have you done something? And you're given a range of responses because respondents may not exactly remember the specific number. The categories on the left show zero to one, one to two, and two plus. So the problem here is that if somebody has done something one time, which category do they select? Or if they've done something two times, which category do they select? On the right, you'll see the mutually exclusive options, zero, one, two, three, plus. So if there's three or more, they would pick the upper category. It's often really important to make sure if zero or no times is an option, that you collect zero or none separately. Because if you need to compare none versus some, you cannot do that in the example on the left side where zero and one are collected together. So it doesn't really impair your data entry or data capture capabilities to have one extra category of zero, and then you could have one to two, three to five, six or more. So keep that in mind when you're collecting frequency of times. Another example that you'll see often with non-mutually exclusive categories are income levels. Most people don't know their exact income or they're somewhere where they couldn't easily access it down to the dollar. And so income level is often captured in ranges. So on the left, you'll see $10,000 or less, and then an option of 10,000 to 30,000, and then 30,000 plus. And this shows exactly the same problem as the prior example. If you are $10,000, which box do you check? Or if you're 30,000, which box do you check? On the right side, you'll see this problem alleviated. These categories are now mutually exclusive. So less than $10,000, 10,000 to 29,999, and then 30,000 plus. So when designing categorical variables, make sure that your levels are mutually exclusive. That is, it doesn't make it possible for people to fall into two different response options at the same time. So what about categories being exhaustive? On the left, again, you'll see not exhaustive examples, and on the right, you'll see exhaustive examples. So the first very simple one that we see often is gender, male or female. Now, the majority will fall into one of those two self-identified characteristics. However, there are other options, and particularly depending upon what you're researching and what your population is, you may need to have a much more exhaustive list for gender male, female, trans, and an option for people to write in other. When creating exhaustive categories, that's often the best way to create the opportunity for everyone to find something that they fit into in terms of response levels, is to create an other option and let them write in their identification or their response. The second option is, do you have a copay for your health insurance? The obvious answers would be yes, no. However, again, depending upon your population, if you're covered by a parent or a significant other, or if you've never used your health insurance, so if your job is new and you have not gone to the doctor yet, you may not know. So that's another example of how to make categories more exhaustive. The standard yes, no, and I don't know, or I don't have insurance. Because again, if you simply ask the question of do you have a copay for your insurance, if someone does not have insurance, what do they check? 
do they check no and get lumped in with the no copay group? You have no way to differentiate them from whether or not they don't have a copay to whether they don't have insurance. The third example, again, is looking at how many sodas did you have this week? So it's collecting a frequency. So again, people may not exactly remember that they had seven sodas, but they could estimate, well, I generally tend to have one a day, so I'd fall in the five to 10 category. But what if you have a respondent who has five sodas in a given day? Well, in a week, that's more than 20. So make sure that your mutually exclusive categories on frequencies are also exhaustive. So again, on the right, we fixed a couple of issues. Zero or none, one to five would approximate a soda on a day during the work week. Six to 10 would be the work week plus weekend. 11 to 20 would start to get you into the two per day range. And then more than 20 would be in the three per day range uh, for the week. So it's really important, in addition to mutually exclusive categories, that you have exhaustive lists. So we've seen some examples of mutually exclusive and exhaustive categorical data. What specific types of categorical data are there available for use? This falls into three main types of categorical data, dichotomous, nominal, and ordinal. Let's first look at dichotomous variables. These are characterized by two options stemming from the word die, two, being two, dichotomous. Common options will be yes or no, event or no event, disease or no disease, some or none. And again, this is why you should always collect zero or none separate from other frequencies or other levels. So if you're asking someone about their pain level, none should always be separate from low amounts of pain because then you can collapse those categories to look at no pain versus any pain. So dichotomous is fairly simple. This is the easiest categorical data type, just two responses. And again, they're mutually exclusive and exhaustive. So now let's look at nominal. Categories in name only, as nominal would apply. Remember N for name only. And there is no inherent order to the responses for nominal categories, even if you have a personal preference. Handedness, so what is your preference for writing? And the common concept would be dichotomous, left hand or right hand, but some people are rather ambidextrous and use both hands primarily. So make sure to have an option there and that would take it from dichotomous to a nominal variable. What do you drink in the morning? Coffee, water, juice, tea, or other? The other allows for exhaustive categories, but again, there's no preference here or inherent order. So really think about what the purpose of your question is. Why do you need this information and how you're going to analyze it and collect it as specifically as you can when you're capturing the data. And then you can always reorganize the categories for analysis. So we have dichotomous, which is two categories. We have nominal, which is just a listing of responses, but no inherent order. And that leads us directly to ordinal data, where there is an inherent accepted order in the responses from high to low or worse to better. So think about things like what's your level of pain, low, medium, or high. I've never been a smoker. I'm a former smoker or I'm a current smoker. How has your pain level changed since I last saw you? My pain is worse, my pain is not changed, or my pain level is better. And then how quickly can something happen? Is it slow, is it moderate, is it fast? So you can see here that there's an inherent accepted order in what's called a hierarchy for these responses. And that's what makes it an ordinal variable. Now, you can always collapse an ordinal variable down to a dichotomous variable. So none, some, many, all could be none versus any. Or you could look at never smokers versus any history of smoking. So now that we know what categorical data is and what types of categorical data there are with the dichotomous nominal and ordinal, how do we report categorical data? The simple answer here is you always report the N and the percent of categorical variables. Always, always, always report the number of responses in each level and the percentage out of the total. Sometimes you'll also see the cumulative percent. You'll often see the mode. So what is the most common response? And you'll often see a graph with the categories. 
With dichotomous variables, graphs are usually not needed. You can simply report, say, the percentage of yes, and you automatically know that the rest of that is the percentage no. But with multi-level or ordinal variables, graphs can often be very useful. And this brings us to the concept of cumulative percentages. This is very common in categorical variables, but for ordinal variables only. The variables that have an inherent order in the responses, you can sum up the categories or accumulate them when you are reporting them. So for example, we have a question that asks, how often do you feel pain? None of the time, some of the time, a lot of the time. And we have 50 responses. And you can see here that 10 people said none or 20%, 15 said some or 30% said some, and 25 or 50% said a lot of the time. This could also be reported as none or some pain 50% of the time versus a lot of pain 50% of the time. You could also do no pain 20% of the time and any type of or any level of pain 80% of the time. So in ordinal variables, you can accumulate up to the 100%. And again, this doesn't make sense when you're talking about nominal variables because there's no order. All of the percentages and nominals will total to 100%, but it's not easy to break them up into these types of cumulative percentages. So for this next activity, introducing categorical variables, Again, open practice module three in the SBP weight data and jump, open the practice three worksheet, and we will determine the categories that we have, what type of categorical variables we have, and then reporting the N in percent in jump.